Good morning. Try it again. Good morning. All right, it's a beautiful day today. Glad to have everybody here. We're going to go ahead and get started. So if my musicians will come up here, we will begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and for the wonderful weather outside and the great, this great opportunity to come into your house, to worship your name, and to hear from your word. Dear God, I ask that you guide us as we do that this morning and glorify your name throughout everything we say and do. And I ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand as we begin. Why you ever chose me has always been a mystery. All my life I've been told I belong at the end of the line with all the other not quite. With all that ever get it right. But it turns out we're the ones you were looking for all this time. Cause I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody we're all about some. We got a number of announcements this morning. Uh, so just to start out, just giving you some quick updates on some things. So these are some things we've been announcing. The prayer chain, I sent out a test text message and phone calls to the people who are on that. If you either were previously on the prayer chain or currently on the prayer chain or not on the prayer chain and didn't get that text message, didn't get contacted and would like to be, please see me after service so we can get that fixed up and remedied on that. Uh, we have another, uh, another set, some more meat available. So if you have any need or know of anyone in need of some frozen meat, just uh, see, see me once again after service on that and let me know. We are still in need of one Sunday school teacher. That's going to be for our middle school age kids. So if you are interested in that, please see Marla Arrowwood. And then we have the dates, and we're going to get more details out in the coming weeks. But just to let you know so you can mark your calendars, VBS is going to be June 7th through 11th this year. June 7th through 11th. A few other announcements. Go to that next slide for me. 
Ah, uh, they were both doing it at the same time. <laughs> Adult Bible study continues this week at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. This week we are covering Daniel chapter 2 and in, in, uh, looking at Nebuchadnezzar's vision. So let me ask you this, okay, because I've seen our Bible study attendance, but I have a question for you. How many of you want to know more about the end times? Okay, if you want to know more about the end times, we're going to be covering Nebuchadnezzar's vision, which is very prophetic from the past to the present to the future. We're going to talk all about that this week, so we'd love to have you join us 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall for that. Uh, next up... Okay. <laughs> We're still collecting cleaning products and uh, personal hygiene items for both males and females to give to serve. So there is a box out there in the foyer. If you already put stuff in that box, we did clear it out to go ahead and give what we've already gotten. And so we're still taking more just to let you know on that. And then I think I have one, one or two more. Me to we. So we have a married couple's date night coming up Friday, May 14th from 6 to 8 p.m. We will have child care for this. We will have a loaded taco and nacho bar and games. And it's going to be a really good time. Uh, it's $10 per couple. Uh, uh, please sign up for that and come join that. You'll have a great time, I promise. And I have one more, and then I'm going to hand it over here. Uh, we are resuming our fifth Sunday combined services May 30th. So we held off on doing that throughout 2020, and I think we missed one fifth Sunday of 2021 just because of all the stuff we were dealing with with the pandemic. But this fifth Sunday, so May 30th, we're going to have a combined service with special musical guest uh, Tim Price and the worship team actually from the church that Kelsey and I used to attend before we moved out this way. So our schedule for that morning, we're going to do something a little bit different than usual. From 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, we're going to have what I'm calling a warm-up, all right? Now, if you played a lot of sports, you know what a warm-up is, but, you know, all we're going to do, we're going to come in, we might sing a couple songs, we might just visit, we might have a little devotional, we'll have some time of prayer, but it's going to be very laid back, but we're going to come in and warm up from 8 to 9, from 9 to 10 have Sunday school, and then have our combined service at 10 a.m. So please put that on your calendars, we will be on a little bit different of a schedule uh, that, that Sunday morning. With all being said, Gary's got some announcements too. Good morning, everybody. We got a new microphone, so I'm excited to play with it. Um, there's someone's water. We have sign-up sheets out in the hallway for the committees, so they'll be out for a few weeks. So um, see what you like, what you want to sign up for, and then please sign up for it. Um, talking about the combined service, we're going to throw another curve at you. We're going to do a combined service on June 6th. That is the day of our annual meeting. So if all goes well, we'll be done with our combined service at 1130, and we'll have our annual meeting. Um, I would encourage all to come, and the reason I would encourage you to come is we're providing lunch that day. Um, I think we're going to be doing fried chicken, but uh, we will take care of all that. All you got to do is come to the meeting um, and then go eat. Um, if you're not a member, you can come to the meeting. You're just not able to vote, and we will uh, be more than happy to hear any requests, any questions, any comments on that day before we have our lunch. Um, um, starting next week, we will have baby bottles here. And if you remember the baby bottles, they're for faith maternity. Fill them up with chains, with dollars, with whatever you want to put in there that's monetary. And we'll get those into faith maternity. They'll be here from uh, Mother's Day until Father's Day. So that's what I have to say. And, and uh, thank you very much for listening. Now notice on my slide for the combined service for the end of May, I did not put an end time for service. <laughs> No, we'll, we'll hopefully have you out by 11.30 that day, too, but we'll just see. I just figured I didn't want to put myself in a box there. Um, so as we transition to our theme time, uh, we're entering a new month, and that means we are back towards our second category. So we've been talking about being Bible-based, and now we're back to talking about being discipleship driven. This is one of the hardest aspects of Christianity to really get down as a church. You know, we can have the sermons and all the teaching be as Bible-based as we want, but the groundworks, the actual ministry that is done in the church is often the ministry of discipleship, really investing in people and helping people become more like Jesus. And Jesus himself in the Gospel of John gives us the way that we can do that. So if you go to that next slide for me. Only one of two, not two of two. Okay. In John 8, 31 and 32, which we covered this some weeks ago, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you, really, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Please go to the next one for me. Thank you. To be Jesus's disciples, 
We must abide in his word. The whole reason we have that, that uh, philosophy of being Bible-based is because that is the only way that we can be discipleship driven. If we want to know Jesus, we have to be in the word of God. If we want to help other people know Jesus, we have to take them to the word of God because my opinions, even if my opinions are right, my opinions aren't going to change anyone else's life. But the word of God can change the life of even the most lost and undone sinner. So keep that in mind as you go throughout your week. Uh, now we go into our prayer times. Anyone have any praises they'd like to share? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, well, praise God. That's two blessings. He found a mushroom and then he shared it. So that's amazing. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Congratulations to Devin. Uh, yeah. She graduated yesterday and that's wonderful. And we had some other graduates yesterday too. I don't see any of our other ones in here right now though, but okay. Yes. Praise God. Did you say 40 years ago today? Well, praise God. Awesome. Anyone else? Any praises you'd like to share? Well, my sister got to come home Thursday from the hospital. She spent four days in the hospital. Thought she had a heart attack, but they did find out that she either has emphysema or COPD. And so she's working with the, the lung specialist to try to figure out how to get it corrected or as much as they can. And also, she is trying to quit smoking from 34 years worth. So, it, you know, pray for the struggle it's going to be. So, yeah, she's trying. She so, has not smoked since she's been in the hospital because she's right. not even realizing that yeah. she's going to have to quit. So that was a scary situation. So if you're on the prayer chain, you got something about that last week, I think, which she was in the hospital. They weren't sure what's going on. And so the praise is, hey, now that we know what's going on, we can fight against it, but obviously still need prayers. Uh, because it's a big battle. If anyone, if anyone in here, if you ever try to give up smoking, that's not a fun process to try to get away from. So keep her in prayers as well. Anyone else have any praises they'd like to share? Any prayer requests? All right. Well, uh, please bow your heads with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come into your house once again with thanksgiving, for there is no other way that we can come in to prayer because just the fact that you listen to us is not a right, but a privilege that you bought for us through the blood of Jesus. And so we praise you that you hear our prayers, that we are not just speaking into the air and not just speaking to no one or nothing, but that you do indeed hear us and that you answer our prayers. Dear God, I praise you so much for I've seen time and time again where you've answered my prayers. And, and I know I'm not the only one here, so I just want to glorify your name in that. Dear God, thank you for, for all the blessings you've given to our church, from the smallest to the greatest of things, oh God. Uh, please continue to be with those in our fellowship who are sick, who are afflicted, who are weary, oh God. I ask that you give them encouragement, that you give them strength, and you help them to overcome that which they're facing. Dear God, I ask that you be with those who are discouraged. Dear God, I ask that you provide encouragement through your son. And dear God, I ask that you make us instruments of your glory and instruments of your ministry, oh God, that you might teach us how to be disciples and how to make disciples, that people might see our good works and glorify our Father that's in heaven, and that they might see that we truly are different from the rest of the world because we are people of Jesus. Oh God, make that true and use this service to do so. I ask in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. amen. <laughs> Please stand as we sing our next song. <clears throat> I am surrounded on every side, can't see the light of day, but I am persuaded beyond all hope, you won't let go of me, I stake my claim on every word you say.
a late praise. Sorry. <laughs> it takes me a little while, a few ticks. I'm getting older. Um, as I look around, I just think, I don't know how many years ago we started this early service. Mm -hmm. It was basically Don, Ken, and myself. And I look now and just see how it's grown, and I just praise mm -hmm. God for that. Disappointed? Are you desperate for hell? You know what it's like to be tired and only a shell of yourself. You start to believe you don't have what it takes. Cause it's all you can do just to move, much less finish the race. that we can't even fathom what it's going to be like someday. Fathers, we go in the rest of our service, and as Cody brings our message, I just ask that you open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to hear what you have for us through him today. It's in your son's precious name I pray. Amen. Amen.
All right, turn once again to the Gospel of John. We'll be in chapter 17 this week. And chapter 17 represents a, a transition. So we've been looking at Jesus and his disciples are heading towards the Garden of Gethsemane, where, as, as you know, many of you know, he will soon be betrayed, he will soon be handed over, arrested, uh, persecuted, mistreated, and then eventually executed on the cross. And so he's been telling them for the past few chapters about exactly what is going to happen and that basically that a lot of stuff that's going to happen is not going to make sense, but there will come a time where it will all click. He talks to them about the Holy Spirit that's going to come and live within them. And then we left off with our very last, very last verse last week where he said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world and, and this song that we just sang really goes right along with that. We're almost home. That yes, in this world you're going to have trials, you're going to have tribulations, you're going to have difficulties, but this world is not our permanent home. This is just our temporary home. Okay, You are not a body that has a soul. You are a soul, a living being that has a body. There is going to come a day that if Jesus tarries, that we will pass away here on this earth. But that does not mean your life stops. Your life is going to continue on. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are going to be where he is. You are going to continue on with him eternally. But what we see in chapter 17 is a transition. Uh, as John MacArthur notes in his uh, study notes for this passage, he says that this prayer, so Jesus is about to offer his high priestly prayer. He says this prayer symbolizes Jesus' transition from his earthly ministry to his intercessory ministry. His intercessory. I'm sorry, I'm excited, all right? His intercessory ministry. He's been teaching and leading the disciples here on earth and doing so faithfully for a number of years, but he is getting ready to depart and go to heaven. He's going to go and be with the Father, and he's giving them an example through this prayer of exactly what his conversation with the Father will continue to be in heaven. So what we're going to find in this chapter, which, which time permitting and me talking 90 miles an hour will permit us to get through the whole thing in one week. But what we're going to see is a summary of so much of what he has already been talking about. So verse 1 says this. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. As I said, this prayer is going to be a summary in some ways of what Jesus has been teaching, a summary in other ways of the entire gospel. But notice, even in the first verse, the relationship between the Father and the Son. He says, glorify me that I might glorify you. You see this unity that, that the whole reason Jesus wants to be glorified is so that he can bring glory to his Father, like a perfect Father and Son relationship. The father dotes his love on his son, and the, the son, in turn, dotes his love on the father and tries to impress him, and they're always trying to uh, outdo one another in a good way, to show even greater love towards one another as time goes on here. Then we get to verse 2, and it says, Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Jesus' ministry was to bring eternal life to who? All of us, to whosoever would believe, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. The scope of Jesus' ministry was every single human being. That is who is eligible for salvation. The sinner and the saint, just kidding, there were no saints without Jesus. All of us were sinners, for all had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. Every single person here this morning is eligible for salvation. We make the mistake in the world of thinking church is only for the good people. Jesus is only for the good people. You have to do things a certain way and act a certain way for Jesus to want anything to do with you. And that's false. And in fact, it's impossible. Without Jesus, I would be just as wicked as anyone else, probably even worse so. But Jesus takes us, forgives us, saves us, and then changes us so that we can then be good. Verse 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. 
So eternal life is the goal of this salvation. We want to live forever. You know, the world, many men and women have sought uh, immortality throughout earthly means. You know, people through modern medicine were able to extend people's lifespan because people have this fear of death. Death is our greatest enemy, and Jesus Christ has the answer to death, which is eternal life. But here specifically, he defines what eternal life actually is. This is eternal life that they, being us, disciples, those who believe, know you being the only true God and Jesus. Eternal life is not just a time span, it's a quality of life. To, to have eternal life is to know God and to know his son. To believe in Jesus, to receive that life, and then to know him is life. Knowing Jesus is eternal life, it is self-sustaining and it is self-replenishing life because God is the source of life. Now, you can probably, some of you in this room can relate to me on this. There are times in this life where you might feel like you are a shell of yourself, that there is still breath going through your lungs, but you feel like you're dead. You don't need to raise your hands, but let me just ask you and you can answer to yourselves. Have you ever been there? where you are a dead person walking, where you know that you are breathing, but you are not really alive. That's where I was a little over 10 years ago when Jesus got a hold of me. That's when Jesus called out to me. When I acknowledged that, you know what, though I am alive, I'm dead. I, I, told, I remember telling my friends as a freshman in college that I was dead inside, that I was drained, that there was nothing in me at that point. I was a shell of a person. And that's when he reached out to me and said, yes, you are. Let me make you alive. And he has made me alive. And that life has been knowing him. Because life has still thrown tons of problems at me. But the difference between before Christ and after Christ is now with every single problem, I have this faith that I'm going to get through it because I know in whom I believed. I know who my God is. I know who my Savior is. And I know that he has conquered even the greatest problem that life has to offer, which is actual death. And rising from the dead on the third day, he showed that he is supreme even over the greatest problem that mankind can face. This is eternal life that they know you. Verse 4 then says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. This verse points to the completion of Jesus' earthly work. He had a couple of tasks left to finish. Anyone know what those couple of tasks, tasks are? He's going to go and die, but he has to show that he's greater than death. He's going to be raised again. But everything else that God had given him to do, he had faithfully accomplished. And he's going to tell us what those things are here in a little bit. But he had been faithful to God in every single area of his life. And without getting into all the details, if you were to look at the Old Testament and look at the sacrifices that they had to offer for sins in Israel you'll see that the animals they had to offer were not the uh, worst of the herd. They couldn't offer the worst of the flock. They had to offer a lamb without spot or blemish. They had to offer the best of what they had as a sacrifice. And Jesus, and what he's saying here is basically saying, I have proven to be a lamb without spot or blemish. I truly am qualified for what I am about to do. I have glorified you and accomplished everything you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And so therefore, he's saying basically he's heading back to heaven not to receive any new glory, but returning to the glory that has been his since before time even began. Jesus Christ was crucified on a cross a little over 2,000 years ago. But Jesus Christ, in another sense, was crucified for your sins before the foundations of the world. The decision was already made long before it played out in history that he would do that. He wasn't trying to attain any new glory. That he was just returning to the glory that has been his all along. He says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. What does it mean to manifest something? When you think of the word manifest, what do you usually think of? Brought out, yes. Where do you see the word manifest used in common talk today? 
Anybody see the stuff that happened in the Suez Canal, I guess a little over a month ago? That ship likely had a manifest. What's the purpose of that manifest? Tells you what's on the ship. Tells you everything that's on there because it's a giant ship and you don't want to have to go through and look and identify everything. So you have a piece of paper that says, here is everything that is supposed to be on this ship. Likewise, Jesus says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Okay, God is spirit. Has anyone seen God face to face? No, he's invisible. He's immortal. He's, he's everywhere, but you can't see him. But Jesus says, I have manifested your name. Jesus is the physical representation of everything that God represents. He is the manifestation of God. He says, I've shown everyone who you are, basically. He says, yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. Verse 8 as well. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. The disciples have acknowledged that Jesus is indeed from God, that he's not speaking of his own accord, that he's not just this great teacher, or this wise man, but that he truly is of God. Here's an interesting thing. There are some today who do not believe in God, but yet will say that Jesus was a great man. Now, to me, that's contradictory. Because if Jesus was not truly who he said he was, then he's sounding like a crazy person talking to thin air right now. And they believe that, oh, Jesus knew that, that God wasn't real, so he was just doing this for show. I say that's too inconsistent. That would undermine too much of who Jesus is. I can tell you faithfully, Jesus believed he was who he said he was, and he proves he is who he says he is. You cannot have Jesus as just a good teacher. It doesn't work. He's either Savior and Lord, or you need to dismiss him entirely. It's hard to find any middle ground based on the claims that he himself makes. If he says he is God manifested in the flesh, you have to deal with that claim. If one of you, I don't care how smart you are, if one of you tells me that you are God manifested in the flesh, you're either going to gain a lot of credibility or lose a lot of credibility. I'm not going to just take that as a neutral statement is what I'm getting at. So you can either have Jesus as Lord, or you can go away from him, but you can't have this middle ground of, well, I respect him and like him, but you know he might have been wrong about some things. No, it just doesn't work. He is who he is. And the disciples, and we, if we are also his disciples, believe that God sent Jesus to this earth. He says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. This is a very important and interesting distinction that Jesus makes here. So there's another thing. Some misinterpret John 3.16. John 3.16 is a favorite verse of most Christians because it so simply clarifies what Jesus came to do. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. And so some people will read that and say, oh, for God so loved the world. Oh, God loves everyone in the world. There's this good God out there and he couldn't punish anyone. He couldn't hold anyone accountable for anything because he's love but notice Jesus doesn't say I'm praying for the whole world he says I am not praying for the world but for those whom you have given me you see Jesus is going to come again and he's coming again as a conquering king his first coming he came as a suffering servant who came to die and pay the price for sins this was not to say that, hey, all the sins you want to commit from now on are just fine because I already paid for it. No, it's to say, here is what this pattern of life is leading to. That the one righteous man who comes to you, you kill him on a cross. The second time he's coming as a conquering king. The first time he came as an emissary with an offer of mercy. To say, if you want to be delivered from the king who is going to come and enact justice on this earth, here are the terms, you need to believe in me. If you do not, when he comes back to conquer you and you are found his enemy, you have nothing to expect except for judgment. Because here's the thing, God cannot just overlook sin and pretend it doesn't exist. And would you really want him to? See, it's bad theology, because here's the thing, someone has hurt you in your life, amen? Everybody been hurt by somebody in your life? 
Absolutely, each and every one of us have been. And while I can show mercy for a lot of things, and God can show mercy for any number of things, the problem is, if people don't take accountability for their actions, it's very hard to show them mercy. Do you think that Adolf Hitler deserved mercy? Absolutely not. He led to the death of over 6 million people. Now let me tell you this. If Adolf Hitler would have repented, truly repented, and said, I have done wrong, I am sorry for what I've done, he could have been forgiven and saved. But if he did not, and he went to his grave saying, what I did was right, and I'm glad I killed all those people, would you not want a holy and just God to hold him accountable for his actions? That's the thing of the gospel. It can't just be this feel-good gospel because there are people out there abusing and hurting people, and some people would say, oh, we want them to get off scot-free. No, I want them to be saved, but being saved comes through taking accountability and laying these things down at the foot of the cross and saying, yes, I did do wrong. The beauty of the gospel is that God does not have to pretend our sins never happened because he pays for them himself on the cross. But I, I'm saying that to talk about the specific scope of Jesus's effective ministry. He came to minister to the whole world, but the only ones who are saved are the ones whom God has given him out of the world. His followers, his faithful believers. He says, I'm praying for them. Then in verse 10, he says, all, are you, all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. Once again, just as we've mentioned before in this chapter, he's pointing once again to the unity between the Father and the Son. Everything that is yours is mine and everything that's mine is yours. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. See, here's an issue, and we're going to talk about this a decent amount throughout the rest of this today. In his saving work, Jesus did not remove the disciples from the world. Okay, like I said, we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but I want to draw your attention to the latter portion of this verse for now. Okay, we're going to talk about the, the former portion in future verses. He says, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. What is the goal of salvation? What is Jesus' goal in saving you? Save from what? Save for what? The end goal of salvation is that we might be united with God the Father and God the Son, that we might identify with them, that we might be as they are, that we might be holy, that we might have eternal life, that we can live with them forever. The goal is unity in the faith. Wouldn't it be great if where two or, two or more are gathered, there weren't three or four or five or six opinions? Wouldn't it be great if we could all agree on everything? Now, on this earth, do you think we're going to agree on everything? Of course not. And in fact, at times, it's good we don't. We're not going to start from a place of unity. We're going to have different opinions. We're going to have different viewpoints. That's always going to be the starting place, and it's good that that's the starting place. Otherwise, we'd have a very narrow view, and we wouldn't be very helpful to a lot of other people. But the end goal of this salvation is that we reach unity, that we find this unity, and in our big picture purpose, we say, yes, we are all on the same page, and that page is not my page, it's not any of your pages, it's the page of Jesus Christ and the page of God the Father. That's the page we all eventually need to be on, that's Jesus' goal of when he leaves us on this earth, that's what he wants for us, to all become united in the faith, working towards the gospel of Jesus Christ to create disciples, teach, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that he's observed. That's our big picture purpose. Jesus continues, he says, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus was faithful to his disciples on earth. He only lost one, and that one was prophesied that it would happen, that it had to happen, so that Jesus could go to the cross. You know, you know why Jesus had to be betrayed? Do you? I'll tell you. Jesus had to be betrayed because many of you will be betrayed at some point in your life. And if Jesus is our high priest and he is there to be there for us in our weakness, God saw it fit that he would go through a lot of the same types of heartaches that you will go through so that he can empathize with you and can understand. 
Jesus had to be betrayed by one of his closest friends so that you will know what it's like, so that he knows what it's like to be betrayed, so that when you are betrayed, he can be there to help you. Jesus willingly, willingly went through all sorts of different kinds of pain just so he can be there for you. Okay, keep that in mind. Not one of the others had been lost. He had been faithful with everything that God had given him. But now I am coming to you, Jesus speaking to God, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. He's been faithful on earth, but he is about to leave them and go to heaven. Leave them in a cruel and dark world, and yet he desires for them to have joy even when he is no longer with them physically. Even when the world around them is both cruel and dark. See, this presents a little bit of difficulty for us. Because if I was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, I would not have wanted him to leave me and go back to the Father. I would have wanted him to stay right there with me and basically hold my hand through all of life's difficulties. Now, was Jesus still going to be there for them? Yes, but it was going to be in a different way. That's what he's been talking to them about. But it still would have been fearful. It still would have been challenging. But Jesus' goal is also that we would have joy his joy fulfilled in us. How can you have joy unspeakable and full of glory in a world that is so cruel and dark and full of hurt? He says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Not only is the world just naturally cruel and dark, but Christians, people who truly follow Christ, will be hated and will be hated because of the name of Jesus. Because they are no longer like the rest of the human race. Church, the world is going to hate you if you follow Jesus. You understand, peer pressure doesn't stop when you get out of high school. If you truly want to follow Jesus, you will face criticism for it. You will be hated for it. You could even be arrested in some countries for it. I saw a headline this morning that a member of the Finnish parliament, parliament in Finland, was arrested given six years in prison simply for posting Bible verses that had to do with, it had to do with the, uh, the whole issue of marriage and sexuality. She did not uh, just state her own opinion or try to pass legislation. She merely posted scripture of what the word of God says was arrested and is, is facing up to six years in prison for that. Just because she does not agree with the worldview, with the opinion that the world is putting out there. If you disagree with the world, they are not going to like you. And Jesus says that. But here's the thing. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Here's the big picture lesson I really want you to learn today. Jesus leaving them in the world is very important. Sometimes I wish that when God saved me from my sins, he would have just raptured me away and taken me out of the world so that I didn't have to face all the difficulties that were in front of me. Wouldn't that have been nice? If I got saved and now all of a sudden I don't have to suffer anymore, no more challenges, life is easy, I get to go be in heaven, that would be great. But Jesus didn't choose to do it that way. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Jesus intentionally chose to leave us here for the time being. And he does so for a purpose. If Jesus wanted you to be in heaven, he would have taken you there already. He wants you to be on earth because he has a mission for you. He has a purpose for you. What is that purpose? We're going to see it in a couple more verses. Verse 16, he says, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. In many ways, church, we are aliens. We are very weird and unique from the rest of the human race if we are following Christ. We don't do a lot of things the same way that the rest of the world around us does things. We're different, and we should be different, and don't be afraid of being different. We're not to conform to the world around us. We are to be salt and light in the earth. Verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Instead of asking the Father to remove them from the world, he asks that God protects them from the evil one and sanctifies them in the truth, and he identifies God's word as truth. This is once again why I reiterate over and over again, we got to be Bible-based because Jesus says this is how we get sanctified. What does it mean to be sanctified? Big church word, what? 
To be made holy. What does holy even mean? Set apart apart to God. Excellent. So God sets us apart to himself and makes us holy through his word. That's why this is so important. All right, continuing on. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Here's where we get to it. This is why Jesus doesn't want to take us out of the world. He wants to send us into the world. And he says, and for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Jesus gave up a lot of glory. He gave up a lot of easy living in some sense to come and be born in a feeding trough to walk amongst human beings many of which hated him to live a perfect life in a cruel dark and sinful world and he did not do that for his own sake he did that for the sake of all of us and so likewise his desire he wants us to be sanctified and to go and do the same that he did for the rest of the world to consecrate ourselves, to set ourselves apart, that we might be effective witnesses to the rest of the world. And then verse 20 is exciting, because this is one of, the, uh, one of the few Bible verses that is actually written to the Hams Prairie Christian Church, directly to us. Okay? And not just us, but all modern believers. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Jesus left us in the world and sent us into the world so that others might believe through our word. If the disciples were taken away with Jesus, the gospel would have never spread. And 2,000 years later, we would not have been able to know Jesus. But he left them in the world that they could be servants then and also servants to us. And he leaves us in the world that we can be servants to the world, that we can show them the truth, that we can give them the the opportunity for mercy before the conquering king comes back to deliver the victory. Verse 21, it says that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. He once again speaks of this unity, but notice he's talking about that they being both the disciples then and us now. Now here's a question I have for you as we're getting close to closing here. Do you think Peter and Paul and the other disciples, were they any more saved than you are? Does, was the Holy Spirit that lived in them any different from the Holy Spirit that lives in you? No. But yet, we feel like we're unqualified for ministry. Can anybody tell me what seminary Peter went to? Yeah, he was at Jesus University, I guess. He walked with Jesus daily and talked with him. But what was, what was Peter's occupation? Fisherman. Was that a highly educated position? It had specific education. You've got to know how to fish, but it wasn't like a college degree or something. He wasn't this super brainiac. He was simply faithful to Jesus, and Jesus gave him everything else. Paul, on the other hand, was very highly educated. His level of education is probably higher than just about anyone in this room. He's multilingual. Uh, he, he knew a lot of languages. He knew about, uh, well, we, we don't have time to go into all that he knew, but he was a very smart guy, all right? But he said he counted all of that as rubbish compared to the surpassing wealth of knowing Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus Christ and and endeavor to know him even more, he can use you for the same things he used the apostles for. Okay? Keep that in mind. We are all meant to be united. We have the same salvation. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Verse 22 then says, The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. Jesus has given and will give us glory. What's glory? What's that word actually mean? These are all church words that we hear all the time, but we don't know what they mean. Come on. I'm just kidding. Glory means brightness. You know, when you, when you see glory, it's like looking at something too bright to even look at. And so Jesus says, the glory that you have given me, I've given to them. That's being the light of the world. You know, people can see your disposition. Okay? Some people mention this where they can see, you know, you can tell someone's mood oftentimes just by looking at them. And something about the Holy Spirit should give us this disposition that is different than the rest of the world we see around them. Sometimes I get a little bit uncomfortable because uh, how, how many random people at grocery stores will just try to talk to me at times. It's a little bit strange, but I guess I'm welcoming in that way. I have a shirt now that, that we're having a baby that says, Daddy, 
You know, I'm excited that, that I'm going to be a dad soon, and I cannot tell you. I've been stopped in multiple stores and say, does your shirt say daddy? Yes. Oh, congratulations. You have to bring that baby in so I can hold it. And I'm like, I don't even know you. But, but yeah, that's great. But that's the thing. It's the, well, it was even down in Jefferson City, which is, yeah, it's out of the county. I don't even know these people. But the thing is, there is something different about your disposition if you are in Christ. That people see you and they're like, there's something different about that person. I feel like I can talk to them, even though I don't know them. I feel like their child somehow belongs to me, which is terrifying once again. But, but it's exciting too. I, I've told Kelsey I can't wear that shirt if she's not with me because I feel like I might be getting hit on by, by some of these people. <laughs> Strange. It's scary. All right, well, let's get back to the text before I get myself any more in the doghouse. But it says, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. This is the gospel. He sent, God sent his son to teach the disciples how to live and then to die for them. That he being in them, Jesus being in them, and God being in Jesus that they, being all of us, might become perfectly one so that the rest of the world around may know that God actually sent Jesus. The gospel has persisted for over 2,000 years because of the substance found within it. The gospel did not originally spread through the sword as Islam did. Islam has spread throughout the centuries through violence, through oppression, through saying, yes, this is what you're going to believe and you're going to deal with it. Christianity at times, or a false version of Christianity, known as Christendom has acted that way, but that is not how the gospel has actually spread. The gospel often actually spread by people being willing to die and say, you know what, I still believe in Jesus anyways. I'm still going to be faithful. Do what you want to me. They were lighting Jews on fire. They were lighting Christians on fire to start Roman festivals, and the gospel was still spreading. That doesn't sound that attractive to the world. Hey, come serve Jesus. You might die. That's not a worldly means of reaching people. In China right now, the gospel is spreading like wildfire, even though it's illegal, even though they're being persecuted for their faith. People can be, see the substance of a new resurrected life, and it spreads like wildfire, and that's what it is meant to be. That the world might see and know that God indeed sent Jesus and that Jesus lives in us. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. You know, the rest of our lives is a conundrum that Paul spells out. He says, for me, I would rather be with him. I would rather go to heaven. I would rather go and be with Jesus. But it is better for your sake that I should be here. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You know, Christian funerals can be very happy things, because you know that one step in here, and then they pass away, and their next step is in glory with God. They are better off in many senses than we are. And so Jesus says, I desire that they may be with me where I am. He wants us to be with him, but it's necessary for us to be here now so that we can be representatives of the gospel. He says, O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. Jesus wants us to meet God. He wants to introduce us. That's his goal. And he says, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. The love that God pours out through Jesus into us that we might display it in the world. So to quickly summarize, I know I'm preaching a little bit long today. Bear with me. We've got, we got more because we have something really exciting happening at the end of service today too, just so you know, all right? Jesus is our high priest. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He desires to reconcile not just the good people, but whosoever believes in him to God. And he chooses to use us to do it. And that can be an overwhelming weight of glory. I have to confess to you today that ministry is hard. Amen? Ministry is hard. Here's why ministry is hard. As a pastor, there are some intimate details about people's lives that they will, they will share with me. Some of their worst hurts. Some of the worst things that the world has done to them. Some of the worst decisions that they him, themselves have made. And church, I have to tell you that when you open yourself up to those sorts of pain and you try to be there for people in those difficult times, it 
hurts. And the world would rather say, let's cover all that pain up, let's not really deal with it, and let's just ignore it and move on. But, but that's not what God would have us to do. God wants there to be healing. He wants there to be reconciliation. He wants to solve those wounds, and he wants to use us to do it because I can tell you I don't care how much pain I've seen and had to go through and how difficult things might have been to see God use something that I have said or something that I have done to heal someone to positively impact someone's life it makes every ounce of pain worth it Jesus Christ was about to go to the cross and, and suffer an agonizing death, but even in those times, he was not focused on himself because he knew that whatever pain he went through was worth it to do what he had come to do. It was worth it to bring forth salvation. So to close, I challenge you with this. I've been saying this quite a bit. God has not just called me to the ministry. Every single one of you, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if he has you on this earth, it is for the sake of his gospel. Because it would be far better for you from a selfish standpoint if you would just go and be with him. If he has left you on this earth, he has left you with a purpose, to be the salt and the light to the earth. We can run away from those responsibilities because we're scared, because it is difficult and it does hurt. But if you open yourself up to the call and you say, yes, Lord, here I am, send me, he will use you for his glory. No matter what your skill set is, no matter how qualified or unqualified you think you are, if you are simply willing to be obedient to what God gives you to do, he will glorify his name in you and through you. So accept the call. Please join me in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the ministry of your son. I thank you for the new life that he has given us. I ask, oh God, that, that you take this word, and dear God, I feel like I had to go through it so quickly to get through all of it. I ask that you bring it to each one of our minds throughout this week, that we might go back and look at this more, that we might spend some time here in chapter 17 of the Gospel of John and really see your son's heart for us and your son's heart for the world. And I ask that we might take it seriously, that we might be ministers to the world around us. Equip us to do so, God. Give us the courage and the boldness and the kindness and the gentleness to fulfill your call to ministry. I ask in the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. Now, as our musicians come, see, I don't want to give an altar call for this because it's different than that. When I say a call to ministry, that doesn't mean a call to be a pastor. It doesn't mean a call to be a youth pastor. It doesn't mean some formal position. A call to ministry is a call to service. To say, you know what, whatever you have me to do, God, I will do it. You can commit to that today, and if you want to, you can. But the thing is, you need to be ready to commit to that every single day. Because ministry will always stretch your comfort zone. It will always be something different, something more than you thought you were going to be doing. But it is always worth it. As we prepare to take communion, remember, Jesus died so that you could do this. He died so that you could be here today. But not only did he die, he rose again so that you can have that newness of life within you as well. Join me once more in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the body and the blood of your Son. Oh God, for the sacrifice that he made, that we might be freed from the bondage of sin. Dear God, I ask that you truly do free us from that bondage, O oh God, that we might walk in freedom, that others might see that and be jealous of the freedom that we have. And dear God, help us to be equipped to be ready to tell them about Jesus, O oh God, that they might believe that he came from you. O oh God, that they might see him and know him and receive eternal life. Dear God, as we prepare to partake of this, I ask that you make us ready that we take it in a worthwhile manner. Oh God, that we take it in a worthy manner, that, that we don't trample underfoot the body and the blood of Jesus, oh God, but that we realize the significance of this sacrifice. Dear God, help us to truly take these things in remembrance of you. I ask this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. You may take, eat, and drink.
have something very special today before we end service. So if I can get Miss Delaney Horseman to join me up here. I have had the wonderful privilege of getting to know this young lady over the course of the past, I don't know, a couple years or so. Seen her through uh, some highs and some lows, some, some good times and some bad times, and uh, I've, I've grown to have a great appreciation for this young lady. And so she spoke to me last week and said, that she would like to be baptized. And we talked about it a little bit, and uh, well, it almost made me cry. <laughs> but uh, I asked her if she had anything she wanted to say. She said no, public speaking, which, which is surprising. She's an amazing basketball player, right? You know, she performs in front of people all the time, but public speaking is a little bit scarier. So uh, she has asked to be baptized, and so uh, we're gonna do that now here. So give me just a second. I don't wanna get this microphone broken. We just bought one new one. Don't have to buy one. some of the ups and the downs that she really started to cry out to God, which is all that any of us can ever really do. And he's really helped her through a lot of things. And she's professed her faith in him and, and wants to be baptized to show everyone else what God is doing in her life. So Delaney, what I'd like to do is cross your arms for me and you can hold your nose if you want. That's up to you. All right. And so based on your profession of faith and your desire to be baptized, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right, 
right, so as we close here, make sure we, when, when she gets out here, you greet her and talk to her. But we're going to go ahead and close up our service here to remind you of our, our key verse for the day, which says this. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. My hope for Delaney is my hope for each and every one of us, that she might know the truth and be set free, that she might walk in this newness of life and this freedom that is found for all who are in Christ Jesus. And that hope is for each and every one of you. If you do not know him, do not wait another day. Talk to me after service. Come see me. We'll talk about it. All right. Dear God, please be with this people as they go. Bless them on their way, O oh God, and let us truly be the salt and light in the earth that people might see our good works and glorify you. I ask this for the glory of the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a wonderful week.